Hey folks, how's everybody doing? Hope you're doing well, wherever you're at on this beautiful planet we call the Earth. I want to welcome you to this video and give me a minute to preface it. I'm just going to talk informally about my thoughts on the situation in the Ukraine with Russia. Number two, this is obviously informal. If you can't already deduce that through deductive reasoning. I'm sitting in my bedroom, just got out of the shower, no shirt, sitting in my shorts, free balling it, sitting here commando. The air count is on, so you're going to hear some background noise. And the scenery ain't going to change. Okay? Does that describe informal enough to you? <laughs> I hope so, because this is just a chat. If you're looking for something scientific uh, from a 10-pound brain, you know, sitting in a think tank somewhere, you're at the wrong place. But if you just want to hear one, I don't want to say dissenting opinion, but one opinion that uh, may make you think. And, and that's the objective of this video. I never claim to have all the answers. I never claim to be right. What I like to do is invoke thought. And there have been times in my life where I've, I've been an instructor of various sorts. And that's all I do. If, if a student walks out of the classroom thinking about something I said or something in the curriculum, you've won. Because they're going to think about that. They're going to take it home. They're going to you know, break it apart. See what they would do. So there you go. I'm not claiming to have all the answers. I'm not claiming to be right. The purpose of this video is to invoke thought that is on a different plane, a different level um, than what you're hearing from the mainstream media, the U.S. government, um, NATO, all these organizations. I'm just going to break it down to basics. And I guess the basic question is, if you were Vladimir Putin, what would you do? This is sort of like a decision-forcing case. All right, settle down before you call me a Russian loving, blah, 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 blah. Let's continue with the preface. Okay? I'm a pirate looking at 50. So first of all, I, you know, I'm a product of uh, the late 70s, 80s, growing up during what they termed the Cold War. As a child, what the hell did that mean? Well, it meant that during school, elementary school, uh, junior high, you did nuclear war drills where you got under your desk, put your head between your legs, and, and braced for the blast, right? And <laughs> when you get older, really, you just realize that you were kissing your ass goodbye. So I'm a product of that. Like, like every night that shit was on the news, we had drills in school. Russia is the enemy. Well, the USSR, um, the Soviets, the Soviet Union, communism, bad, U.S. and democracy is good. We're the good guys. And so that's how I was brought up. Uh, originally raised on a dirt road in the backwoods of Mississippi, you know, where you're taught to go to church three days a week or three times a week. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. You don't work on Sunday, you pay your taxes, Uncle Sam calls, you go to war, give your life for your country, pay your taxes, go to church, all that good stuff, right? Patriots, patriotism. Uh, you know, what the rich soulless, us poor, uneducated folks, right? That's what I grew up uh, around. That was my initial mentality till I started getting older and having a little bit of independent thought. Really, I had independent thought from an early age. Got me in trouble because I stopped wanting to go to church. Another story. So don't think that I'm some liberal, um, tree-hugging, you know, that type of person. My background is severely conservative originally, but as you get time, experience, and wisdom on your side, you realize that you're at least I do. I'm not a conservative and I'm not a liberal. You know, I'm a realist. What works for the situation, the most efficient 
answer to the problem, um, no matter who comes up with the solution. I'm open-minded, um, so that kind of, if you haven't watched any of my videos, that's type, the type of person I am, right? So, after hearing this, if you want to say, uh, you know, I love Russia and, and Vladimir, Vladimir Putin, you can say what the fuck you want, because to be honest, I don't give a fuck, all right? I'm just at a stage in life. You can say anything you want to in the comments, and you're not going to affect my blood pressure. So that's a little bit of background of that. The same demographic, you know, like the middle of the middle class and down, they have no idea about politics. They can't point to Ukraine on a fucking map. Can't point to Russia on a map. Half of them can't. Um... That's reality, no matter what country you're in. Go to Afghanistan and ask people to point to Afghanistan on a map. Most of them can't. They go to America and ask people to point to uh, Mexico on a map. Hell, half of them can't, can't tell you where Mexico is. You know, so... A lot of people don't understand politics. And that's what the rich want. They want to keep the masses... Stupid, maybe that's one word. Ignorant is probably the better word. They, they want to keep the masses ignorant of the facts. Okay, so let's continue with the preface. A week ago, prior to Russia entering the Ukraine, pretty much the entire world was turned against mainstream media, right? Nobody believed anything the fucking media put out because of this fucking COVID-19 uh, bullshit that they put out that enabled Pfizer and others and other industries to make billions of dollars. Nobody, nobody has believed any of the media, right? Due to all this horse shit that's went on over the past two years. You didn't believe them a week ago. You didn't believe anything the government said a week ago. We didn't believe any of that shit. I think most of us can agree, unless unless you're a very left-leaning liberal who uh, is still trying to read on USA Today of which kind of fucking mask to wear. If you're that person, I'm not going to reach you. I got it. But uh, seven days ago, ten days ago, all of us, we've been tired of this COVID-19 lie. Been tired of government telling us lies and tired of the mainstream media telling us fucking horse shit, right? Now here comes the conflict, the war, the invasion, whatever fucking term you want to use, okay? Don't peg me down to whatever I said, oh, he called it this. You can call it whatever the fuck you want to call it. What's going on in Ukraine? Now everybody in the world is back glued to their TV screens watching what? Mainstream media. Listening to what governments say. From the fucking US government on down to the smallest government. My God, how easily do humans forget for two years? It's been proven. All the bullshit and the lies that they fed to us. But you take this conflict. And now everybody has faith in the media and the government once again. Isn't that kind of funny how nobody's talking about COVID after this started? Everybody's gravitated back to what's called the programming. You know, you're watching a program. You're programming. It's what it's called, what it used to be called, right? So now everybody's back glued to Fox News, CNN, uh, whatever. Take your pick, right? You're glued to the fucking news. To see what's going on in the world. Because now all of a sudden you trust what the hell they're telling you again. My goodness. My goodness. So, in addition to that, fear makes money. Now folks, I'm going to say one thing. This is not scripted. I'm not reading the script. I'm pulling everything out of my head. I've got a few tabs open on the computer here that I'm going to share with you just for talking points and reference. But let's go back to the, the basic tenet that fear makes money. Why do I say that? Well, the defense industry doesn't make a whole lot of money during peacetime, right? 
because they can't fool the average taxpayer into supporting the new weapon system or buying, you know, a thousand more bombs or what have you. So peace is not good for the U.S. economy because if you don't understand the U.S., it's uh, ran by the oil industry and the defense industry, the military industrial congressional complex. I call it MIC for short. It's not designed for peacetime. Peacetime is not good for, for any of that. Anybody over there in Washington, D.C., it's not good. So by keeping that in mind, fear makes money. Okay. Um, now, when I say war generates money, in, in actuality, it doesn't. Because uh, let, let, me, let me go deep here for just a second. If a country spends a million dollars to invade the next country and say they have gold mines and you seize... 10 million dollars worth of of gold well it's 10 million profit minus the 1 million you spent on your army and equipment and everything else and you made 9 million dollars then you could argue war makes money in the u.s it doesn't work like that because you know we're going to go to a country and spend x amount of millions of dollars per day um and there's no return on that investment other than what's perceived to be a political, a geopolitical gain at the time. So really in America, war doesn't make money for the country as a whole because it just puts us further in debt. I don't know how many trillions the U.S. deficit is now, but we, we are the most in-debt country in the world, in history. Um, but people think that war makes money. In modern times, at least in the U.S., it, it really doesn't. We just go farther, further, farther, whatever, in debt to the tune of trillions uh, to, to fund this war machine. Um, so it's a quagmire. So does war really make money? Not in that model. Does it generate funds for the economy? Well, yeah, but the taxpayers are footing the bill, A, or you're borrowing money. And so it's sort of like the dude in the trailer park who gets a credit card, right? The U.S. US is like riding a big credit card. You're in the trailer park, you get a credit card, you're buying everybody beer, you're paying dues to work on your deck, you're paying a dude to wash your car. Are you stimulating the economy? Well, yes, you are, but it's a false stimulation because you've got to pay that money back and you don't have money to pay it back. All right, so moving right along. Fear makes money. Uh, for the past two years, governments have lied to us. The media has lied to us. But now all of a sudden, everybody is, is back in line. You, get, you put you back in line because of, uh, <clears throat> because of armed conflict. Smoke, bombs, fire, firefights, all that shit sells newspapers. It sells airtime so they can put ads in front of you and charge their advertisers. That's the way the media works. So when everybody just starts watching YouTube videos and they're not glued to that TV and the demographics aren't there, well, the advertisers aren't paying them big money because the views are down. Now, the views are back up. Everybody's glued to, I don't know, ABC, CBS, CNN, whoever the fuck you're glued to. Because you want to know what's going on in the Ukraine with this Madman Putin. All right, now there's a few more caveats and a few more disclaimers. Did I already say this is an informal talk? If you disagree, feel free. Matter of fact, I hope you disagree with this presentation. And you do have the opportunity to leave your opinion down in the comments below. I'm not going to delete or ban anybody unless you're just an asshole attacking somebody else's opinion like an asshole at dinner uh, say what you want to say and disagree because I truly believe that dissent is the ultimate form of patriotism and being that I'm about to dissent with the uh, the narrative of the United States government the Pentagon the media it takes a lot more fucking balls to disagree with the masses than it is to agree. It's so easy to just be a sheep and go along with what what's going on. But uh, 
This ain't the first time I've dissented on something and it cost me and it won't be the last, you know? I lost a six-figure job over my opinions and dissenting over this same topic. All right, as I think of the additional disclaimers, because what are we? How many minutes? We're 15 minutes into disclaimers, but it's okay because I don't know how to tell a short story. I have to set the stage, set the context and everything out. So without further ado, what we're going to do is listen to a video. Now, I believe this is December 2021, and it's a uh, reporter here. This is from Sky News. I don't know shit about Sky News. But it's a female reporter asking Putin a series of questions, and all we're going to do is listen to this, watch it, and I want you to tell me if this is the talk of an absolute madman, or could this possibly be the talk of a person who's been backed into a corner year after year after year to the point that there's nowhere else to go. So so here we go. And I hope the audio is okay. If not, all these links will be down in the, the description. But here we go. You also say you have no intention of invading Ukraine. So will you guarantee unconditionally that you will not invade Ukraine or any other sovereign country? Or does that depend on how negotiations go? And another question. What is it do you think that the West does not understand about Russia or about your intentions? Thank you. Speaking of the security guarantees and what it will depend upon, or if something will depend upon the negotiations, our actions will not depend on the negotiation. They will depend on the unconditional compliance with the Russian security demands today and in historical context. In this sense, we have made it clear that any further NATO movement to the east is unacceptable. Okay, let's stop right there for a second. Any further NATO expansion to the east is unacceptable. Okay, keep that key point that the man just said in your head. There is nothing unclear about this. We are not deploying our missiles over at the borders of the U.S. No. On the other hand, the U.S. is deploying its missiles close to our home, on the, on the porch of our house. So, are we demanding something excessive? We're simply asking them not to deploy their attack systems over at our home. Okay. He's saying, hey, we're not over in your hemisphere. You're over here in my hemisphere on the porch of my house deploying weapon systems, you know, too close. Like the man said, is that unreasonable to bring up the fact that it's unreasonable? Canada and the United States or Mexico and simply deploy our own missiles over there. Okay, Canada or uh, Mexico. We are going to look at some maps. But I don't think what he said is unreasonable. What would happen if we brought our missile systems or inducted Mexico or Canada into our organization, whatever we want to call it, the equivalent of NATO? What would happen? This is a matter of security, not just history. This is about security. It is not the negotiations that matter. It is the outcome, the result. I've reiterated this many times, and you're well aware that we said not an inch to the east. That was the NATO guarantee in 1990. So what became of that? They fooled us. We've seen five waves of NATO expansion. Now they are in Romania and in Poland, and they're deploying the relevant attack systems over there. That's what we're talking about. You should finally understand, we're not threatening anyone. We did not come to the US borders or to the UK borders. No, they, they came to our borders, and now they're saying that Ukraine will also join NATO, and they will deploy their systems there or not just NATO, they will simply deploy it on a bilateral basis. They will deploy their military bases and their attack systems. That's what we're talking about. And you keep demanding some guarantees from us. You must give us the guarantees. It is up to you, and you must do this immediately, right now, instead of keep talking about this for decades. 
Okay, I'm not going to play the whole video, like I said. But in the video, he says, you know, why, why couldn't we be treated as an ally? He's talking about the, the weapons inspections and stuff. I guess about 20 years ago, I worked with a guy who grew up in Moscow. He was Russian. And we worked together every night. Just had a few conversations together about what it was like growing up in Russia, what it was like growing up in the U.S. And I said, hey, man, we were taught to believe that you were the enemy, that y'all were going to y'all were gonna launch nuclear weapons and kill us all, and communism was bad. And, you know, you were my sworn enemy. The commies, the reds, the Russians, the Soviets. And he basically said the same thing. And we're about the same age. And then we sat down and we like, we never understood why. We still don't understand why. You know what I mean? Yeah, here we are, you know, products of the of the 80s, supposed to hate each other. Now we're in America working with each other, re relying on each other every night, depending upon one another, just talking about this shit, trying to figure it out. Because the government told, told us that we had to hate one another? That's what we had to do? Well, when you tell children that, you know, um, uh, they're kids. We're kids. We didn't know to question it. All right, folks, I'm back. Uh, that was last night when I did the first part of the video. Now this is, uh, next morning, Tuesday morning. So let's continue on. The North Atlantic Treaty. What is NATO? North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Again, if you take the middle of the middle class on down, Pretty much in any country, they don't know the first thing about politics other than what they learned in school when they were kids. Most people are just trying to make a living and survive, you know. And they're not in tune to everything that the 10-pound brains know or think that they know, sitting in a think tank or sitting in your newsroom reading off a teleprompter. Okay, so let's just, hey, what is the, what is NATO? So here you go. Washington, D.C., 4 April 1949, the North Atlantic Treaty. The parties of this treaty reaffirm their faith in the purposes and principles of the Charter of the United Nations and their desire to live in peace with all peoples and all governments. They are determined to safeguard the freedom, common heritage, and civilization of their peoples, founded on the principles of democracy, individual liberty, and the rule of law. They seek to promote stability and well-being in the North Atlantic area. They are resolved to unite their efforts for collective defense and for the preservation of peace and security. They therefore agree to this North Atlantic Treaty. Okay, Article 5. The parties agree that an armed attack against one or more of them in Europe or North America shall be considered an attack against them all, and consequently they agree that if such an armed attack occurs, each of them, an exercise of the right of individual or collective self-defense recognized by Article 51 of the Charter of the United Nations will assist the party or party so attacking by taking forthwith individually and in concert with the other party such action as it deems necessary, including the use of armed force, to restore and maintain the security of the North Atlantic area. Any such armed attack and all measures taken as a result thereof shall immediately be reported to the Security Council. Such measures shall be terminated when the Security Council has taken the measures necessary to restore and maintain international peace and security. <clears throat> it's a big long article to say, look, everybody that's involved in NATO, if you attack one of those countries, it's like an attack on everybody. So in a sense, NATO is like one big country. It's like the United States of America. If somebody comes and attacks Arizona, it's an attack on the United States, right? It's not just an attack on Arizona. So if somebody comes and, uh, you know, attacks France, it's an, it's an attack on everyone. So really, what is NATO? It's one big, sort of like United States, right? Now I'm going to not try to get off this topic till I read the next article, but who really runs NATO? 
Think about that for a second. Let me pull up the next article. Okay, this is Article 6. For the purpose of Article 5, an armed attack on one or more of the parties is deemed to include an armed attack uh, on the territories of any of the parties in Europe or North America, on the Algerian departments of France, on the territory of Turkey, or on the islands under the jurisdiction of any of the parties in the North Atlantic area north of the Tropic of Cancer, on the forces, vessels, or aircraft of any of the parties when in or over these territories or any other area in Europe in which occupation forces of any of the parties were stationed on the date when the treaty entered into force or the Mediterranean Sea or the North Atlantic area north of the Tropic of Cancer. <laughs> All right. It's a big group of countries with a per pretty big area, right? That they are basically agreeing that if anybody attacks any of these countries, any of these areas, any of these islands, any of these territories, it's an attack on everyone. Okay? Now, you heard in the video how uh, President Putin was saying not one step more to the east, right? So take a look at this map. It tells you in 1949, in the dark blue, those are the countries that join. Then from 52 to 82, uh, the next 30 years, those are the ones that join, and so forth, right? You get down to the yellow. Okay, so what, what, what do you see? You see a natural progression pushing closer and closer and closer to the east, to the border of Russia. The man's not making false statements. This map, this map right here, is is a basically an illustration of, of what's happened. Current aspirations to join. What's that big yellow blob right in the middle there? That big yellow blob would be what country? Ukraine. Now, take a look and how much border the Ukraine has with Russia. Without Googling it, I don't know. But there's a significant line um, on their eastern, northeastern border that borders Russia. So all of a sudden, it's not just, when, when, he, say, when he says on our doorstep or on our front porch, you know, if Russia is the house, the Ukraine is the front porch. So at what point, maybe this is premature to, to ask, but if you're Vladimir Putin and this organization, which is basically, let's just say it, the U.S. runs NATO. Oh my God, did he just say that? Yeah, I just said that. The U.S. runs NATO. Don't believe me? Okay, just pick any of these countries on the NATO list. Let me go down here and let me pull the list of countries. Okay, so I'm just gonna pick a, a random country here that, that's in NATO, right? So let's go to Lithuania. If Lithuania says, hey, we, we have a problem with Colombia. We want everybody to go to war with us. Do you think anybody in NATO is going to listen to the tiny country of Lithuania? Let's be honest. Don't think they're driving the boat. Let's pick another country. Italy. I love Italy. I love Rome. Uh, love going to Pompeii. Love the country, the history. My goodness. But do you think if Italy has a problem... They're going to generate the steam for NATO, the United, including the United States and Canada, to go to war with somebody else? No. They're not. Who drums up these coalitions to go to places like Iraq, Afghanistan, various other places in the world, and then NATO members have to go as well? The good old U.S. of A. The good old military-industrial-congressional complex. 
Now, again, I'm looking at this, I'm trying to put you in Russia's perspective. Put yourself in Vladimir Putin's shoes. You're the leader of a country. You're responsible for the security. This organization called NATO, which is basically the United States, calling the shots, keeps getting closer and closer and closer to your borders. At which point do you draw the line? Okay. Now, 7,000 nukes. The U.S. has, Russia has about the same amount, a little bit more. I don't believe all the statistics because I don't think nobody actually knows. Why? Because governments lie and they maintain secrets. Let's just say each country has 7,000 nukes. Um, now you have other nuclear capable nations, but the big two are the United States and Russia. So here you go. It's the U.S., gobbling up countries, inching closer and closer and closer to the borders of a perceived enemy. It has 7,000 nukes pointed this way at the U.S., 7,000 nukes pointed that way. Time is obviously critical. The closer you can station your weapon systems means the less flight time. It means those missiles are going to get there quicker than if you have to send them over the poles. And in time... Is critical in any any type of war or armed conflict. So do you see where we're getting at here? At what point, if you were Vladimir Putin, do you say you've got too close to our borders and enough is enough? Five NATO member states across six bases. Belgium, Germany, Italy, the Netherlands, and Turkey. So anyhow, with those NATO members, you, you already have weapons station there. Take a minute to look at a map and let's take the screenshot there and basically I did that southern coast of Turkey up to Moscow. It's roughly what 2,000 kilometers somewhere in there. So wherever those those missiles are actually stationed in Turkey you're talking to the capital of Russia it's a couple thousand kilometers. All right, we'll go to this map here. People, people must be forgetting history. Because what happened back in the 60s? Okay, the U.S. had put nuclear weapons in Turkey. The Soviets got tired of that being right there, so close to their country, so close to their capital, that they retaliated, tit for tat. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. They started putting missiles right there in a place called Cuba, which is what, roughly 90 miles off, the, uh, off of Key West. I drew a map right there. It's about <clears throat> just under 2,000 kilometers to Washington, D.C. So it was tit for tat. You know what I mean? What, what was the difference? Hey, you had, you had nuclear missiles in Turkey within 2,000 kilometers of, of Moscow, and so we just did the same thing to you. But the minute the U.S. found out, it became what? The Cuban Missile Crisis. So when you sit here and you ask yourself, if you were Vladimir Putin, what would you do? And what he's doing? And people are calling him a madman. Well, then logic says you have to call John F. Kennedy a madman. Because the same thing happened of back in the 60s. All right, so let's pull up that. Cuban Missile Crisis. 13-day political and military standoff in October 62 over the Soviet installation of nuclear-armed Soviet missiles in Cuba, 90 miles from U.S. shores. Let's see. Kennedy made it clear the U.S. was prepared to use military force if necessary to neutralize this perceived threat to national security. My goodness. It was avoided when Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev offered to remove the Cuban missiles in exchange for the Cuban missiles, or in exchange for the U.S. promising not to invade Cuba and a secret agreement to take the missiles out of Turkey. 
This was uh, very close to, to becoming World War III. And, you know, I'm not going to go over all the circumstances, but the basic circumstances says enemy brings nuclear weapons too close to our shores, to our territory. The U.S. was ready to do anything and everything to prevent them from doing that. We, it was basically war. We had naval ships blockading what they call the quarantine. It was very close to World War III. But why was it such? And see, this is from a child just studying this in school, <clears throat> just using deductive reasoning. You want to raise your hand and say, uh, you know, Mr. So-and-so, why was it okay that the U.S. put nuclear missiles next to Russia, but it wasn't okay for the Russians to put nuclear missiles next to the United States? One word, hypocrisy. You know what I mean? That's, that's all you can explain it as. It's, it's absolute hypocrisy. So, if you're not familiar with the Cuban Missile Crisis, watch a couple documentaries, educate yourself, and then you might find yourself saying, what the fuck is the difference? The U.S. was ready to invade Cuba. They were ready to bomb Cuba. They quarantined the fucking island. They took action. So, is that merely what Putin is doing right now? They forced him, we, the United States, forced the man into taking action because you're, you're just getting too close. You adopt uh, Ukraine into NATO. Now you've got all this border. You're next to me. That's not, that's not even like putting missiles in Cuba. That's like putting missiles in Mexico or Canada. The borders are touching. So if Vladimir Putin's a madman, then you got to say John F. Kennedy was a madman. It's the same fucking history repeating itself. Okay, so who's to blame for this? Look, obviously you want to have every tactical and strategic advantage over your enemy as possible. But you don't want to push those advantages to the point of nuclear war. That's the end of all of us. A lot of people don't understand what's going to happen in a nuclear war. You've heard of this thing called a nuclear winter. It basically is the same principle when the asteroid struck that wiped out the dinosaurs. It's going to eject so much uh, radiation, particulate, dust, everything else into the atmosphere that is going to block out the sun. There's nothing going to grow. Okay, the earth is going to cool. The majority of life on the planet is going to cease to exist. You're going to freeze to death. There's nothing to eat. There's no way anything can grow for decades. Everything's going to be so damn radioactive that uh, if you're alive, you're not going to live long due to radiation exposure. It's not going to be a pretty sight. So the U.S. has kept land grabbing NATO. The U.S. has kept land grabbing, land grabbing, closer and closer, putting a squeeze to the point that you're causing this conflict. At what point, if you were Vladimir Putin, do you draw the line? And the Ukraine was the red line for him. It looked like they were going to get into NATO. That's, that's the line in the sand. So there you go. Now me as an American, would I have pushed this and pushed this east until the guy has to take action? No. Because unless you want a war, I'll talk about that in a second, unless you want a fucking war, there, there comes a time when you, you, you don't push it. You don't push it over that fucking, uh, that red line to get yourself there. You get as close as you can. You know, you got a good tactical advantage. You got a good strategic advantage. This guy knows it, but he's okay with it. And you just stay there. 
it's hard to say, but sometimes you have to just just hold up, stop what you're doing, and say, hey, we got a good position. Or B, if things get so fucking ratcheted up, maybe you back down just a little bit to cool shit off. But if you keep going and going and going, 7,000 nukes coming this way and 7,000 nukes coming this way, it's over for all of us. I don't know about you, but I'm not willing to take that fucking chance. Now look, you may think that I sound cold and I'm not concerned with what's going on with, with women, children, old men, senior citizens, and, and even the soldiers that are fighting and dying right now. That's not the case. But you have to understand that U.S. leaders and sort of an oxymoron, anyhow, the U.S. and Russia are looking at these countries like they're looking at a fucking board game. They're looking at this from a strategic, big picture thing, and they're just fucking pieces on a board. It's not about the people in Ukraine. It's not about hurting the people in Ukraine. This is about you're getting your chess pieces too close uh, to my king, and I have to fucking take action. So then you go back and you say, is this what people want when I say people? Is this what the military industrial congressional complex wants? Yes, it is. They don't give a shit about the people in Ukraine. This is a, a proxy war so they can make more bombs, build more fucking tanks, manufacture more weapons. Isn't the timing just too perfect? What happened? We just pulled out of Afghanistan. It was embarrassing, right? Fucking, uh, you had like the, the three stooges planning the exit from Afghanistan. We just left Afghanistan. Now everybody's, oh shit, they're looking around like, where, where are we going to go to war now? Where are we going to fucking sell these weapons to? We got to make bombs. We, oh shit, our stock's about to drop. Boom, let's just keep pressuring Putin which has been in the works for years. So he does this. And now look, every country in NATO wants what? More weapons. They're saying, we're going to arm Ukraine. You know why? Because they're going to give the Ukraine their old stock, you know, old technology, whatever, purge their fucking, their armies and their military of all this old ass equipment, throw that in there. Now they get to buy new shit, new and shiny shit from the U.S., the U.S. is happy because fucking stocks are going up. Everybody in, in D.C. is fucking pouring champagne right now. This is what they wanted. You throw all these weapons into the Ukraine. Uh, they get littered all over this fucking side of the country. Now, when this shit settles, you got to bring contractors in to try to recover all these munitions. Same shit going on in multiple countries around the globe, right? It's just a fucking meat grinder. The military industrial complex is just a fucking meat grinder. This is what they want. Do you think they give a shit about the people of Ukraine? N no, they don't. No, they don't. And this is not about the people of Ukraine. This is about a, a, a board game. Your, your people are getting too close to my territory. We take action. The other side loves it because they're fucking making money off of the war machine. Was that rambling? I'm sure that it was. But you see what's going on here? And all these fucking lying ass politicians in DC stand up, talk about he's a madman and this and that. Every fucking one of them got stock in the damn defense industry. They have jobs waiting on them the minute they fucking retire from politics or the military. Who do you think these defense com companies are made of? They're it's the, it's the fox guarding the hen house. Folks, I could talk about this shit all day. Let's go, let's go to the next screenshot here. All right, so let's do a little exercise, okay? Put yourself in the shoes of the president of the, of the U.S. No, I'm not talking about uh, Joe Biden. I'm not talking about anybody in particular. You, you're the president, right? And let's start this out here. 
And we'll just start out in Venezuela, right? Because there's been some Russian influence in Venezuela, Chinese influence. Venezuela is home to the world's largest oil reserve. So if you're wondering why Venezuela is on the news or it's been on the news instead of, you know, Ecuador or Guyana, whatever, guess what? Venezuela has oil. That's why we give a fuck about Venezuela. So say the Russians come over and they take over Venezuela, right? They take over Venezuela and they form an organization. Colombia says, hey, I want to join. It's just like NATO. An attack on one is an attack on all. So you're the U.S. and you're like, holy shit. You know, Venezuela, Colombia is banded together. And then uh, Panama and Costa Rica join up. Boot the Americans out, right? Now Nicaragua wants to join. Okay? Next thing you know, we get all the way up to Guatemala. Guatemala wants to join. So all of a sudden, from here to here, this is basically Russia. Because they have an agreement that an attack on one is an attack on all. So the minute, say, Guatemala joins this group, the U.S. can't attack Guatemala. If they attack Guatemala, it is the same thing as attacking Russia. It's World War III. So the only reason that Putin right now can attack Ukraine, because Ukraine is not part of NATO, not part of that agreement. If they attack anybody part of NATO, it's basically declaring war on the United States of America. It's nuclear war. So he had to, he had to act before the Ukraine becomes a member state of NATO. So let's go back to this case here. So Guatemala joins, right? And then Belize says, hey, we're going to join. At what point, if you're sitting up here in Washington, D.C., do you say, holy fuck, there is no way we can let Mexico join this Russian uh, NATO? Because if that's the case, they can put nuclear weapons all across the southwest border. Well, you can't wait until Mexico joins the organization. You have to strike before. Because once they join, it's like a made man. It's like the mafia. You can't touch them. Or it's over for all of us. So by the time they get to Guatemala or Belize, trust me, the U.S. is invading Mexico. We are taking over fucking Mexico to prevent them from moving any further north and letting that country on our border become a member of that Russian organization. So let's back it up. All right, say you're the president, right? And the Russians start in Venezuela. Let's say Colombia joins. Then somehow or another, they get Panama to join. At what point, if you're the U.S. president, do you go down there and block them? Are you going to let them get all the way up to Mexico? Because the closer they get, it's, it's the less flight time of nuclear missiles. Okay, you're going to let them keep coming north? At which point would the good old USA go down there and, and start attacking and occupying Central America? I would almost say this. If they took over Venezuela, I mean, I'm talking, if they, if they posted up in Venezuela and said, this is Russia, we'd be in Colombia the next day. We'd have forces. Um, I mean, we already do throughout that region, but we would block that immediately. The same as when this little tiny island right here that we deem the Cuban Missile Crisis in the 60s got too close to the U.S. and we would not put up with that shit. Even though it was tit for tat. Same distance to the capital as the nukes in Turkey. Same distance to Moscow. So what are you going to do? If you're the U.S. president, you can just let, let them come all the way up and let Mexico join. That means if you attack Mexico, it's an attack on, the, on, the, on the Russia. You're not going to let them get that fucking close. And I would say that Putin let NATO get too close. And they're regretting that. And they said, certainly, we're not going to let Ukraine fucking join. 
We should have fucking pulled this shit 10, 15, 20 years ago to block this. The U.S. kept lying. They kept expanding eastward towards our borders. We fucked up, but we're not fucking up now. We got to stop them. So in my opinion, is this anything to do with the people, the government of, of Ukraine? Not, not really. I mean, yes, because they were talking about <coughs> they were talking about you know wanting to join NATO. But this was just the red line between the U.S. and Russia. And then the question is, do the people in D.C. understand this? Did they, un did they understand it 20 years ago? And is this what they wanted? Moving right along. Okay, so here we go. Putin implies nuclear attack if West interferes in Ukraine. Why it's not just an empty threat? It's the same threat that Kennedy um, issued back in the 60s. This is the red line. This is it. There, there is no more room for negotiation. All right, so Putin spins a conspiracy theory that Ukraine is on a path to nuclear weapons. You know where that's from? The fucking New York Times. Spins a conspiracy theory. Anytime you hear that, the word conspiracy, conspiracy theory, that's the United States propaganda machine discrediting the messenger or discrediting an individual. Okay, it doesn't even make sense. Okay, to conspire, it means to plot, to plan. A theory about a plan. Well, it's no fucking theory. There's fucking weapons, there's nuclear weapons already in Europe, in NATO countries. New York Times. Am I willing to risk nuclear war with Russia over Ukraine? No, I'm not. And when I say that, when you put nuclear forces on a heightened state of alert, that's a heightened chance that a fucking mistake, a technical malfunction, some bullshit is going to go down and one of them fucking missiles is going to cook off and kick off World War III. Okay, and when I say I'm not willing to risk it, I'm not saying that uh, just allow Russia to, to bomb the country and kill the people. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that if I was the U.S. president, I would get on the phone to Putin and say, Hey, look, man, you made your point. Got it. We got too close. Past administrations have uh, been a little bit too much fucking hawkish. We don't want World War III. We don't want nuclear war. Let's work this shit out, okay? Let's work it out. Tell all your military to fucking halt in place. This is how you de-escalate it. How you end this shit. Tell them to fucking halt in place. Cease fire. That's pretty simple, right? Stop your advance. Stop where you are. I'm not telling you to leave. Just stop. Cease fire. And we'll sit down and we'll fucking hash this out. Because it's not between Putin and the Ukrainian president. I hate to say it, but I'm just trying to talk in reality about who's really calling the fucking shots here and how we got to this point. This is between the U.S. and Russia. I'd be like, look, meet me wherever. You know, I'll meet you in Moscow or you meet me here in D.C. Let's fucking hash this out. Let's come to an agreement that you and your people are happy with. And let's end this shit right now. Codify the fucking agreement. However we work it out where you're comfortable that we're not going to take Ukraine and induct them into NATO. We're not going to put missiles there. Now don't say I'm soft because we've already got fucking missiles in Turkey and four other countries over there pointed right at them. Do we strategically need Ukraine? No. It's not going to make that much of a fucking difference. Okay, trust me. If World War III breaks out, we're all dead anyhow. If we're in Ukraine and, and okay, we save a few seconds flight time, we're all dead anyhow. 
So don't say I'm fucking soft. I'm just trying to resolve this shit where everybody lives. That's it. Halt in place. Cease fire. Meet me at the White House. That's it. It don't matter what anybody else says. I hate to say it. It don't matter what the Ukrainian folks say. It don't matter what the Lithuanians, the, the people in Belarus. You can say any fucking thing you want. But you know, you know who matters? The guy who's in charge of 7,000 plus nuclear weapons. That's Vladimir Putin and the handlers that are handling the U.S. administration right now. I can't say Biden's in charge because he's not. He's an old man who's suffering from Alzheimer's and dementia and everything else that they keep propping up. He's not even in charge of taking a shit. Okay? He's not in charge of taking his own shower, probably. Uh, Kamala Harris is certainly not in charge. That's the scary part. Who's behind them? Who's the hand handlers? It's the fucking military-industrial congressional complex, so they can push anything they want. Why didn't this shit happen when Trump was president? I think two reasons. Number one, there was a fucking true leader in charge. Number two, Putin didn't do this out of mutual respect for Trump at the time. And just decided to wait it out. Do it, to, you know, during somebody's administration that he had no respect for. They probably made a gentleman's agreement, you know, behind closed doors or whatever, just knocking taters, drinking vodka. Who the fuck knows? But the fact is, he didn't do this while Trump was in office. Um, so that is the problem. There is no leadership in America right now. We all know this. And that probably scares Putin even worse because who the fuck is driving the train over there? Even the American people don't know who, who's in charge. So that's pretty fucking scary too. Um, so that's what I would do. Call me weak. I don't, I don't you know, I, I, like I said, I don't, I don't care what, what, what I get labeled. What I care about is preventing any type of nuclear conflict coming down. Now listen, the news are reporting that the, you know, Ukraine is stopping the Russian advance. It's all heroic and sounds wonderful, right? But in actuality, if, if Russia wanted to lay waste to that entire country, they have the capability. And it doesn't need to get pushed to that point. All right. So I offer, offer my solution. You know, if Trump were there, I, I'll just speak to Trump because I don't know who I'm speaking to up in D.C. But let's just assume I'm the president or Trump's up there. Hey, this is what, this is what you need to do. Sit down, crack open a beer, smoke some cigars. How can we fucking resolve this, man? We all live on planet Earth. Putin's going to say, you can't come to Ukraine. It's too close and you're getting everybody scared. And it makes us look weak if you allow the Ukraine into NATO. And when we look weak, then our political enemies take over and they're more crazy than us. Yeah, I agree, man. We got too close. Let's sign an agreement and uh, put everybody at rest, at ease, their minds at ease, and we'll go from there. A madman doesn't offer peace talks after four days of war. Right now, they're having peace talks at the border. You think he's a madman, but they're offering peace talks? I don't think so. Saddam Hussein. After he invaded the, uh, Kuwait, was he offering peace talks? No, he didn't give a fuck. Right? Uh, so I, I don't think he's a madman. I think he's a man backed into a corner. Put yourself in his shoes and look at the map. The map don't lie. If I were Xi Jinping... I would take Taiwan right now. They're going to take it anyhow. It's just a question of how bloody is it going to get? How bad is it going to get? We all know they're going to take Taiwan. If I were the Chinese, I'd take it right now. 
There's no leadership in the U.S., um, which actually makes it unpredictable. But in, uh, in times of a lack of leadership, for me, that's when I take Taiwan. The world used to be divided as the superpowers, the U.S. and Russia. And the U.S. has made so many blunders, strategic blunders, tactical blunders, wasting time bombing brown people in various countries, bombing farmers. That now the New World Order is really Russia and China. Um, I would say in the next decade, that's the two at the top with the U.S. running a close third. And you say, oh, how can that be? We have the most powerful military on earth. Folks, we're imploding from within. We have so many social problems in the U.S. that we'll be lucky to have fucking candidates, viable candidates for soldiers and um, folks to fill our military ranks in 10 years. The U.S. is crumbling from within uh, with so many social problems and so much internal violence. We can't police our own house. How can we go fight other people? It's just, it's on the decline. And it's like the new players on the block are China and Russia. It's funny, I saw a poster. I think y'all call them memes. I didn't know what a meme was. We used to call them funny posters back in the 80s. It was Putin and uh, Z that said, you know, Putin said, hey man, I'm going to go west. And then Jinping said, okay, I'll go east. Who's going to stop them? Who, who, who's going to stop them? And unfortunately, what's right and what's just is not always what's going to happen in the world. Life ain't always fair. talk about principles and talk about this okay listen am I willing to jeopardize some type of nuclear war or world conflict over Ukraine or Taiwan and my answer is no look Taiwan's got a lot of good people there um, their industry in uh, you know the semiconductor industry, they got a lot of stuff going on. Here's how I would solve the Taiwan problem. I'm gonna solve another Taiwan problem or another world problem right here. If I were the U.S. president, I would say, hey, everybody in Taiwan, you now are U.S. citizens. Get on the fucking next boat or the next plane leaving to the U.S. Welcome to America. Dismantle as much of that equipment over there in those factories that are, you know, specialized towards computer chip manufacturer. Put those on some cargo ships and just have a fucking mass exodus of that little island. Welcome to America. Then I call China and say, hey, man, you can have that fucking piece of shit rock over there. Y'all happy now? Move in there. We don't give a fuck. You can have it. Now look, is that capitulating to China? Is that surrendering? It's however you want to look at it. For me, is the juice worth the squeeze? Taiwan, it's not. I'm not willing to risk escalating that conflict over that fucking little tiny island, that piece of rock right off of their coast. Make all the people U.S. citizens get the equipment out, all the technical shit, and let them have it. Welcome home, motherfuckers. You've been dreaming about coming back to this place and reuniting it. Okay, here you are. You're reunited with this piece of shit fucking rock out here with no natural resources. Congratulations. But guess what? We got all your smart people over in the U.S., and we got all the equipment, and we'll just fucking manufacture chips over in the U.S. and save the fucking shipping costs. 
Put that shit in your pipe and smoke it, Xi Jinping. You can have that motherfucker. That's it. I bring the U.S. Navy here back to the Philippines in such goddamn force that they rename the fucking country. You can have that fucking rock up there, but we just moved in and force right down here. There you go. Now what y'all gonna complain about? We would still fight over the islands in the South China Sea, but the Taiwan... Taiwan is a personal thing to the Chinese, and they're not going to fucking get off of that subject until they take it. So just fucking squash that problem, too. Folks, some, sometimes to maintain peace, you have to give up ground instead of fucking trying to hold everything. You know, look at empires that have crumbled because they tried to hold too much ground. When you try to hold too much, you become too weak. It's, you're too thin. You're diluted. But if you hold a smaller piece of ground, um, you have more forces to hold that, and then it's not going to get taken. So the U.S. needs to realize we, we are no longer we are no longer the fucking world's policemen. We are no longer calling the shots to every country on the globe because other militaries have come up. Technology has come up that has the capability to challenge us. Um, and unless we want another global war it's just time to start uh, what's the word I'm looking for it's just time to start being a little bit more reasonable about things does that make sense and then when a true conflict really comes your way, you're prepared to handle it decisively. Not sit there and bomb farmers for 10 years for no fucking good reason. So there you go. Ukraine, not give them the country, but give them the guarantee, the real guarantee that they're not going to be a part of NATO and we're not going to put fucking weapons there. That's it.